Hello everyone, welcome back to the Exploring Mechanobiology podcast. This program is organized by one of the NSF-funded Science and Technology Center, the Center for Engineering Mechanobiology. In this episode, I am so excited to interview one of our leaders in CEMB. As a principal investigator at Boston University, as well as a co-leader of one of our integrated research trusts within our multi-institutional center, we will listen to his journey in the mechanobiology field and how he manages his multi-roles as an academia. So please join me to welcome Dr. Chris Chen. So Dr. Chen, um, if, if you can start with like, tell us a, a little bit about yourself and your current roles. Sure. Um, I, I'm a physician scientist. Uh, I'm a professor of biomedical engineering at Boston University and the Harvard Wies Institute. Um, I founded uh, Boston University's Biological Design Center, where I lead a group of great scientists that are focused on how to build biological systems like new artificial proteins and signaling pathways and even synthetic tissues. Um, and I'm involved in a couple of other NSF-funded centers. In addition to CMB, I'm also a deputy director of uh, a NSF engineering research center on uh, cellular metamaterials. And its focus is on how to build uh, heart tissue. Cool. And as we are working in an emerging field like mechanobiology, which every people might have different easy explanation about what it is. So how do you define what mechanobiology is for general public? I think of mechanobiology as simply the question of how mechanical forces impact biological systems and how cells and tissues and organisms use forces for a variety of applications. What is the focus of your lab? Yeah, I mean, my my group is uh, focused on studying how cells uh, organize into functional tissues, like, like heart tissue or, or bone tissue. Um, and then we try to use the insights from studying how cells do that to build what we call synthetic tissues uh, in the lab, um, or to even induce tissue regeneration in our bodies. And how do does it relate to mechanobiology? What are you trying to uh, simulate from those platforms? There's a couple of levels where mechanical uh, forces and mechanobiology uh, come into this work. Um, so uh, when cells are attaching to each other and trying to kind of form some kind of organized tissues, they have to use forces to pull and push on each other and to uh, simply mold that structure. Uh, so we're trying to understand how those forces are used in that setting. But also many tissues, again, like bone or skeletal muscle or heart muscle or even skin, um, they all respond to forces. They, they adapt and, and change their biology. They change their mechanical properties. They're, they change their uh, uh, state of uh, function in response to different forces. So for example, we all know that if we go out and exercise, that our muscles get stronger. Um, they get stronger because the cells inside those muscles are experiencing forces from exercise and then turning that into a response where they start to build bigger cells, stronger cells, and, and more cells. Yeah, as you brought up about exercise, what forces is actually involved? There, there are many different types of mechanical forces that cells respond to. So, for example, um, one of the forces we study is, is shear stress in, in blood. So when your heart pumps faster, blood flows through your circulatory system faster through the blood vessels. And when it does that, it, it applies a shear stress, just the force of the, the blood moving over those cells uh, causes those cells to react by changing their behavior. 
Um, so it turns out, for example, in, in blood vessels that um, certain levels of shear stress are actually quite healthy. It causes the endothelial cells, the cells that line these blood vessels, to, to behave in a way that makes the vessels healthier. Um, but there are other forces, either if the shear stress gets too high or if the shear stress starts to oscillate. So instead of going all in one direction, it goes backwards and in other ways, the, the cells get confused and they go into an inflammatory state. And that often is the beginning of injury. So we think about things like atherosclerosis, your blood vessels form plaques, you know, atherosclerotic plaques. Those all start at the very beginning with some kind of uh, inflammation in the endothelium. And so it turns out that the forces that the cells experience play a big role in, in whether they are pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory. That's cool that, uh, you know, that mechanical forces can also affect the inflammation and the, like there are a lot of going a lot of things going on and yeah what is your biggest inspiration that brought you to this research field in mechanobiology ah uh, honestly i think i've always been interested in in forces in biology and i think part of that is that um i as a young kid grew up playing soccer and i i ran track um and what i noticed is that that process of exercise makes us stronger. But at the same time, there are many of my friends who would maybe exercise a little too robustly and would get injured. And I was always interested in what is it about these forces that is causing the tissues in our body to either do better or to do worse. Um, and so uh, if we think about sort of non-living materials, like, like let's say just a rope, uh, if you pull on it and the stronger you pull, at some point the rope breaks, but the rope doesn't change its strength from you exercising the rope uh, in the same way that our body does. And so clearly the living uh, tissues are are somehow adapting to, to these changes. Um, and so I was just curious about how that happened. And I always wanted to know if there was some way to study it. Uh, and so when we got to the point that uh, I developed the sort of research skills to be able to do it, I, I certainly wanted to make that a big part of my research program. It is very well known that you established different platforms to study mechanobiology. So can you tell us more about that? For me, um, I've always had this, as I said, interest in, in forces and how cells are interacting with those forces, but also what kinds of forces are cells generating on their own. Um, and uh, what was challenging was that there weren't that many tools that were already developed to study that process. So there were many tools that were being developed by scientists to study, for example, gene expression or changes in protein um, uh, signaling activity. And so you could simply learn those techniques and use them. But, but to take, um, to try to understand what kinds of forces that cells were generating or what kinds of forces we should be introducing to cells is something that didn't really exist as a common toolbox that any biologist would learn how to do. And so um, oftentimes we had questions that we wanted to answer and there wasn't a way to answer it without developing some new measurement or some new tool to be able to sort of study it. Um, so that, that's how we started to invent things. You know, we wanted to see whether cells generated certain forces in different conditions. And so we needed to come up with some way to measure those forces uh, as they were doing that. And and once once you develop a certain culture in a lab, then it's very easy for that culture to persist, right? Because if you have one student that is inventing a new measurement technology, then other students say, oh, I want to do that too. I want to come up with another new invention. And so 
people sort of build a, a certain culture and expectation for what they want to do for their research. Um, so it, it's become sort of a natural process for people in the lab to think about whether they can make something useful that, that other people can use. Um, I always tell people it is not useful to build a tool for the sake of building a tool, right? You want to have a question that you want to answer and then design a tool that can answer it. And then you know your tool is useful. Given that most of like creating the new tools requires a lot of like customized um, features, which also needs troubleshooting and also optimization. How did you train your students to decide like this is good enough, like this state is good enough to launch as this platform to answer the questions? Uh, it's a very thoughtful question. I don't, I don't know if we are that strategic or thoughtful about it. Um, we often try to answer questions with the existing tools. So if you think about it from a lazy perspective, we it takes a lot of work to try to make something new. So it's much easier to answer questions with the tools you have. And, and often that's where we start. But sometimes the answers we get are unsatisfactory. So for example, um, we had we had at the very early Part of my career, we had wanted to measure traction forces of individual cells. And there was a tool that existed, which was traction force microscopy. You could put cells onto gels and then measure the deformation of the gels and back out forces from that. But um, we wanted to find ways of measuring that force without using this um, complex assumption about what the nature of the mechanics of the gels were. And so one of my students uh, who had a background in MEMS uh, thought we could make uh, pillars that would deform. And then just by measuring the deflection of the pillars, you can back out forces much more directly. And so we made these devices, put cells on it, and then measured it. And of course, the very first generation um, was very finicky, difficult to make, um, not very reproducible. And so when we wanted to ask questions with that tool, we couldn't because we could only um, get measurements out of, let's say, a few cells on a substrate. And if we wanted to do statistics and look at hundreds of cells, the student would have had to spend two years doing that. So at that point, instead of using the um, poorly optimized device, he needed to find a way to make the device more reproducible. And when he got to the point that it was reproducible enough that he could get the measurements he needed, then he stopped optimizing anymore. And he got his data so that he could publish a paper. Um, the the truth is is that often at that stage um, it's hard to know when to stop um, optimizing. So we tend to stop when we can publish something new, and then when another lab approaches us and says, "Hey, we love that tool. We'd love to learn how to use it." Usually at that moment in the process of teaching them, we realize that it is maybe not useful enough, not easy enough for another lab to adopt it easily. You know, it might take, uh, let's say, a year to be proficient at using a new tool in my own lab because that student was developing it themselves. Spending a year learning how to be expert in it was fine. But for another lab that just wants to use it, they want to be able to learn it in two weeks. So then we have to make the tool more useful, more robust, more reproducible, easier to manufacture, easier to analyze, software that is easier to use. So in the process of then kind of moving that technology further, we have to keep advancing it until other people can use it easily. And when it reaches that stage, then you feel like, okay, now finally 
it's good enough. We can also take a look on your very recent publications in physiology, which is entitled Mechanical Response of Cardiac Micro Tissues to Acute Localized Injury. This one using very well established, like has been more than 10 years, I believe. Mm -hmm. And the other one used very new platform. It's published in Science Advances, Engineering a Living Cardiac Pump on a Chip using high precision fabrication. How did your group come up with the idea? Okay, let's uh, let's let's make a new platform. That Why do we build these different culture models in the first place? So the question always is, is the model that we have good enough to study the thing we want, the question, to answer the question we want to answer? And sometimes it is good enough. And then we can use that tool. Sometimes we think it doesn't capture a key feature. And when, when it doesn't, we think it's important enough, then we want to build a new model that is focused on capturing that new feature. So in the case of these two examples, in the Science Advances paper making this cardiac pump, the problem that I had posed was that we have this micro tissue system already with cardiac cells that has these two pillars and the tissue in between them and the tissue is contracting and pumping against these pillars, right? Mm -hmm. There are some aspects of that that are similar to what happens in the heart. The heart pumps and it experiences resistance and then it relaxes, right? But in the heart, when you pump, you pump at high pressure throughout the entire power stroke. So from the most extended version of the heart's muscle to the most contracted version, it's always pumping into the aorta. So it's pumping against a high pressure that is relatively constant. And then when it relaxes, then it slowly fills with low pressure into the heart until the heart fills, right? And the question that we wanted to ask is, does that matter? Does exercising against a spring, is that different from exercising against a dash pot? And um, we don't know the answer yet, but we had to build a device that actually models that process, that kind of force regime better. And so we build a cardiac pump because then we can put in valves and then we can fill at low pressure and the, the heart has to pump at high pressure so that we can use this to ask if cells are experiencing those kinds of forces, do they react differently than if they experience forces that are like a spring? Um, we don't know the answer yet because we're still doing those experiments, but that's the reason why we built it. In the case of the first paper you mentioned, um, we were interested in how the cardiac tissue remodels in response to injury. And there, we were most interested in how the cells kind of remodel and move around inside of a tissue. Um, we weren't so concerned about the forces per se. Um, we were more concerned about just if we injure the tissue, how do the cells reorganize? And so in that setting, it made much more sense to use a existing model that we had uh, to see if we could learn something different. I have a follow-up question. You discussed about the acute localized injury. So in this study, the force like this viscoelastic mechanical pumping, you don't think it's necessary to affect this acute injury? Or... Yeah, we don't think it's a primary regulator. So, so if we think of it as, again, just this idea of how good of a model do we need, we, we think that we can approximate the and answer the question that we're interested in using a simpler model. Eventually, you can imagine that if we have a cardiac pump that is, again, very reproducible and very easy to make, that someone may want to injure that and see if that response was different from the one that we currently are, are looking at with this older model. So I always think it's, um, I think that many uh, students um, 
maybe don't realize that it is very difficult. It takes many years to kind of make a perfect model. And it takes many years to study a biological question. And so if you want to study a biological question, you can't spend too many years building the model for it. If you want to spend time building a model, you probably won't have time to study the biological question that motivated it. So, so you have to kind of choose, which means we, we have to kind of go through small steps of improvement over years and over the course of many different PhDs. So in this case, you know, we're, we're asking new questions with old models. That's how we get to new territory, but we're also making new models for new questions at the same time, but they're, they're, they're evolutionary steps instead of one giant step. Otherwise we would only publish one paper every 30 years. <laughs> so, <laughs> take too long. Um, so uh, the, the, you know, in, in the paper about cardiac injury, there is something new there, which is that we used a laser to try to in, induce injury in the cardiac cells. We're, we're not trying to model laser injury, right? Like it's not like in our hearts, we experience a lot of lasers and we want to know what happens to it. What we want to do is we want to study na native heart injury, which in our bodies, usually that injury comes from ischemia, mm -hmm. right? You, you have a heart attack because one of your main coronary arteries gets clogged and then the heart becomes hypoxic. And from that hypoxic stress, some of those cardiac cardiomyocytes die. And then we, we know that there's a remodeling event that leads to fibrosis in those regions. So in this particular paper, we have this micro tissue model with the pillars, and then we use a laser to damage the cardiomyocytes and ask what happens to the cardiomyocytes and fibroblasts within our micro tissue, and do they start to um, remodel in a way that is similar to the fibrosis response in a real heart. So again, we're using a different perturbation laser to model a different real event, which is hypoxic injury. Mm -hmm. That probably is not a perfect one-to-one -one match, right? The kind of injury is different, but it allows us to provide a focal injury that's local that we can control. So we use that tool for now. And eventually, maybe there's a way to um, control that with a better model, a better kind of perturbation. So it's it's a good example, again, of trying to get some direction towards where we want to go, uh, even if it's not perfect. Yeah. Cool. And we have clearer, like, examples of what the small, small steps that we can take. Thank you for providing those information. And uh, from from this paper, from the from the acute L class injury, do you put like fully cardiomyocytes or there is also fibroblasts and other macrophages? Or? So in this particular paper, we used a mixture of cardiomyocytes and cardiac fibroblasts uh, because we we're interested in the fibroblast interactions in this tissue. Uh, but in the real heart, um, there's many endothelial cells that also provide the capillary structure around muscle, smooth muscle cells, uh, and macrophages, which are known to be important in injury response. But we didn't have them in this model. So again, you can imagine that future students maybe would be interested in introducing those different uh, cell types into these models and, and make it better. So there should be always room for improvement, whether that happens in my lab or in, in other labs that want to help take that on uh, as they move forward. Mm -hmm. And if we can talk deeper about more on the scientific uh, aspects, like I guess I remember that in the in this paper you focus on the Feynman yes as one of the expression of the remodeling can mm -hmm. you elaborate more on that like what is Feynman and what is its role 
Yeah, so vi vimentin is an intermediate filament cytoskeleton protein, and it happens to be expressed in fibroblasts, and it, it increases in expression in fibroblasts that get more activated as they become more fibrotic. Um, it is not expressed uh, in cardiomyocytes. And so what we wanted to know is that in these regions of injury, what does the vimentin stain look like? Uh, and what do, what do the cardiomyocytes look like in those regions? So we, we were looking at titan uh, and alfactinin, which are markers of cardiomyocyte cytoskeleton. And what we observed was that in the regions of injury, we see a lot less cardiomyocyte cytoskeleton markers like titan or alfactinin, and a very high increase in staining of vimentin, which suggests that there's many more fibroblasts and fibroblasts that are more activated in those regions. So we think that this provides sort of a model that suggests that you have cells that die, cardiomyocytes that die in a region, and somehow, either because of their absence or because they're releasing factors that perhaps are inflammatory as they're dying, that that draws the fibroblasts into that tissue zone, and the fibroblasts now start to fill it and perhaps start to produce more matrix and, and undergo sort of an early uh, fibrotic reaction. So that that's what we were trying to uh, uh, investigate in that in that set of studies. Great. So uh, if I if I understand it correctly, like if you have focal injury in your heart, this location that has more cardiomyocyte that will be taken by more proliferation of the fibroblast. And uh, do you think that if the in this focal uh, in this focal point that we have more fibroblasts, will it be like worsening the, the electrophysiology or it will be even better mm. with higher fibroblasts? So, so what we know in cardiac injury is that if you don't have fibroblasts that come in to remodel, then the muscle area where that where the muscle has died um, actually becomes very weak. The tissue becomes very weak. And when it becomes very weak, then there's a risk of rupture. So the actual tissue will tear and allow blood to come out and then patient dies. So, so the fibroblasts actually provide a adaptive response, which is that they come in and they produce matrix and they actually stabilize that region so that it doesn't rupture. So that's a good thing. However, uh, fibroblasts are not electrically conductive, so they don't pass action potentials the way that cardiomyocytes do. And um, they produce a lot of matrix in inflammatory conditions, so they, the, the area can not only not rupture, but can also become too stiff and actually make it harder for the heart to contract in that region. Um, because they're not conductive, then any um, uh, electrical wave of activity that's coming through the heart into a region of scar, you can actually get arrhythmias because of that uh, abnormal uh, uh, conduction. So there are good and bad things that are happening, and we simply wanted to just see if we can model that process uh, to start studying it. Talking about like, there, there, there is a lot and a lot of more things to follow up. Like, how do you define in general about successful research? Ah, uh, that's a really good question. Uh, um, I think there's many layers of success that are maybe needed. Um, so, certainly, the most important thing uh, at the stage that you guys are at is to develop research questions and um, problems that are one, important to answer, and two, are novel, meaning that, that we don't know the answer to the, those questions yet. And so um, then when you get your results, you're able to publish something that 
that uh, shares with the world something new that you've learned. And I think that's really important. Um, but there are layers of, of success in that uh, usually laboratories like mine and, and, and yours are, are not just looking for any new paper, but are looking to publish new things that are connected to other papers that we're working on so that we can um, support new hypotheses to write new grants, to get funding to support new ideas. And so I think the best papers are ones that not only advance the question that you want to ask, but also provide some tool or platform that lets you study it more and more because then you can always have more things to study from it after you're finished. So you leave behind for your next student that takes over your project an even better project that you need even more defined, even easier to answer, then, then I think that's very successful. <laughs> but it doesn't and, always happen. Yeah, like, I mean, research is always continuing things. Yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> And all of these amazing research and outcomes that you have like uh, established, like they must require a strong team. So if you can go back in time, uh, can you share like your journey, how you started your lab, and mm -hmm. you built your research team, how you choose your topic, like what in maybe not in also not only in academia but also like in ERC or like in every. Um, committee or like team that you build the first thing that i had to find were you know you you understood my mission we want to understand how forces affect cells and how adhesion which is one of the aspects i study how adhesion to extracellular matrix or to other cells uh are are participating in that force sensing um i needed to find students that were interested in those questions um and I found a couple of students that were interested in the biology of that question and other students that were interested in engineering new tools and devices. So I had to make sure that the students that were interested in invention could use their invention skills in a way that would advance my program. And the students that were interested in the biology, I could find some way for them to get their theses in, in cell biology or other areas, again, underneath the same umbrella, but that they could then advance in their own way. Um, and I think as long as um, you view it as a collaborative process, then I think that it's very easy to be successful in that space. And, and I think the other piece that's really important is um, alignment. And what I mean by that is making sure that every person that is going to contribute to your effort will benefit from the effort. Um, because if you develop a program where I take your time as a grad student, I make you take all the risks for your career, and if it doesn't publish, and I say, well, for me, it doesn't matter. Uh, but for you, it means the end of your PhD because you don't get a thesis, you don't get a paper, uh, you don't get a PhD. That means you can't continue on in research. Then that's not a good project, right? Because it's one that we're not all benefiting from. Um, and so I think it's really important to design projects and questions in a way that all the people that are part of that team will advance their career or advance their goals from it. So um, when we built our uh, CMB, for example, we're not just thinking about the individual labs and their graduate students. We're also thinking about junior professors. And if they get involved in this, will they will it improve their chance of getting tenure? Because they will get certain papers. If they work too closely with a senior PI, uh, will their papers be viewed as dependent instead of independent research? Then we're not helping that junior 
faculty advance their career. We're actually hurting them by bringing them in. So we have to help every person at every stage kind of get something out of it uh, in a positive way. And I think once you do that, then it's really easy to let go and just sort of let everybody participate because they all want to advance things that help everybody else, but also help themselves. Then you have alignment. Um, so I think that's really important. Um, and it's also uh, bringing up your mentoring style to your trainees. Like you, you always think about like ben mutual ben benefits um, for not only for you, not only for you, for, not only for the lab, but also for the individual success. And you try to understand like what their skills are and what their interests are and how it can align to your um, to your aim or your target. Cool. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 I think once you have a team that feels that they're um, they will be benefiting within that environment, then they want to give their best, right? Um, yeah. Because they want their friends who are lab mates to also be successful in their goals. And so they they all, everyone wants to help each other in that way. And that that's what creates a, a good environment. Good. So um, one more question, like how do you, like now you already have multi roles, like you're established, you have established your lab, you are directing uh, NSF ERC and other institutes, like how do you balance these multi roles and how do you delegate your jobs? <laughs> Um, I guess the way I think about it is that um, as we get further along in our careers, we spend more and more time um, as catalysts where we help other people do things and we do less ourselves. Um, so so as a as a head of a program, I'm spending less time, uh, in the lab, thinking about uh, the individual research projects. Um, and I'm thinking more about how do I make sure that everybody has what they need to, to proceed. Um, so because of that, um, then sometimes there's other uh, scientists that can help with other pieces of the process of mentoring. So, So I have in my lab, a wonderful scientist, uh, Yaron Aikmans, who was a postdoc in my group and is now a research assistant professor uh, in the group. And he is building his own research career. But at the same time, he's in the lab and has time to help mentor graduate students that are in the lab. And because of that, I still direct projects, but I don't have to uh, if I if I'm not available for three weeks because of uh, a CMB renewal site visit that I'm preparing for, he's there to help you know and answer their questions and get projects moving even when I'm not able to. So this way I'm I'm able to have help for certain things. Um, I think all of us try to do everything that we can on our own. And when we can't, we we ask for help from other people that to uh, kind of uh, help us get everything done. So so inspiring. And who are your most valuable mentors that you think has been helping you along the journey? Um, I I learn from everybody that I come in contact with. I'm always learning. Um, I learn from peers from other scientists that are in CMB and in other places. And, and I see um, maybe best practices, ideas of how they organize their calendar, how they put their reports together, how they write their emails, how they um, uh, use their uh, staff assistants um, how somebody mentors their graduate students. I think uh, all of us are like this. We we watch each other 
and, and you say, oh, that that's a really good way to do it. I'll remember to do that in my own lab. Um, or in leadership, you see we have many examples of really great academic leaders and, and we see how they do it. And then we try to learn from that uh, process. So I have certainly people that I talk to for mentorship, but most of I think what I do well, I learned from just watching and asking people, how did you do that? You know, how, how did you write that big grant? Can you show me what you did? And um, I think it's helpful to be comfortable asking other people how they do things because uh, all of us have learned on our own and we are happy to teach and share what we know. For closing, do you have any advices for the audience? Oh, and all CEMB trainees to keep pursuing their passion in research? Um, my only advice is to uh, be um, mindful of what keeps you excited and not to lose that in the process of going through all of your research training. There's so many periods where you get judged you, you get negatively impacted by um experiments only working one out of every four times or uh somebody at a poster session that says something that is disrespectful or mean or or critical you, you have to just sort of let that roll off of your back and just remember why you're here it, it is hard but the uh successes are very meaningful and, and impact many people uh, in your future. So, so just keep going. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Chen, for joining us today. And it's very inspiring and it's really helpful to listen from your journey. And yeah, I hope you, I, we wish you that you have all of the best for your future endeavors. Uh, thank you so much. I, it was a pleasure to be here and I really enjoyed speaking with you. Thank you.